Well, <clears throat> so far, <clears throat> we have dealt with an excellent debate. It looks like the final speakers have their work cut out for them. The temptation of a concluding speech, especially when dealing with something as emotionally provocative as the health of loved ones, is to finish with grandeur, pomp, and high rhetoric. To conclude with blatant ad misericordium and other appeals to emotion. To tell sob stories and maybe cry a little. Mayhaps I will. But there's nothing inherently wrong about arguing from such a position. Politicians do it all the time. They'll yell at you and pound their fists on the podium to show how much they care about their position and contort their faces into expressions of anguish at even the mention of their opponent's position. Mayhaps, mayhaps I'll do that too. But our argument stands on its own. The statistics speak for themselves. 700,000, uh, 700, 734,600 Hoosiers live every day without health insurance coverage. Each insured family pays an additional $953 in hidden taxes to cover the cost of the uninsured. In Anderson, WellPoint, and United Healthcare Group control 89% of the market. In Gary and his metropolitan area, Healthcare Service Corps and WellPoint control 92% of the market. The cost of family health care coverage has increased 78% since 2007, to an average cost of $12,106. The current unemployment rate is 9.7% and 60.6% .6 of unemployed adults lack health insurance. Something <clears throat> is broken. We can't sit here any longer and watch while private insurance companies extort the public for the sake of the select few who invest in them. More than that, recent federal legislation that is very much similar in nature to the thing in Massachusetts where health insurance premiums are the highest in the nation, which by the way, is not really an option, threats to send our state's residents into spiraling debt unless the government is prepared to enter the marketplace and compete with companies. HMOs, PPOs, and POSs will use the health insurance mandate as an opportunity to raise prices and yet still receive subsidies from the government in staggering quantities. And I would also like to say that even though some states have had trouble implementing public plans, this is not indicative of Indiana's state nor of our economy. Also, public option does not preclude any tort reform or similar reforms. They would only help to lower costs in the long run as part of the plan. Besides that, malpractice reform only leads to about a 0.5% decrease, and uh, that will be ineffective by itself. The national government is too far away from our problems to take care of all of, to take care of us all the time, and neither do we want their help all the time. Federal government is only helpful to a point. It is the responsibility of the state to help us with those problems that are closer to home. We can no longer rely on the idealistic notion of the unregulated free market that has led to so many catastrophes during our nation's history. Banking panics of the late 19th and early 20th century brought on in part by lack of guarantee that the depositors' money would remain liquid in the face of bank failures. The dust bowl, caused by lack of environmental and farming regulations, are now rampant price gouging, encouraged by a nation's recession and lack of competition in the healthcare sector. A public option can provide competition. Run not for profit, with the help of the patrons in mind, a public option plan can reduce overall costs through a focus on preventative care, can increase our overall health and lifespan through a more complete insurance than existing junk insurance policies with limited benefits, and can insure the masses by lowering premiums across the board. Government-run corporations are not evil, nor are they particularly inefficient. They can help us in more ways than one. In fact, they can provide incredibly useful information about the cost of running particular enterprises. In the enterprise of electricity generation, one of the only enterprises like this, mind you, it makes sense for there to be monopolies, since creating competition in any given area would mean running a separate set of power lines for every company providing power. Now, monopolies are something that the government is usually ardently opposed to. So, given the logic, but also the danger of the monopolies in health, uh, in the electricity generation enterprise, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is a government <coughs> power company in charge of managing the Tennessee River Valley uh, power production and the um, hydro, and mostly hydroelectric, electric, was set up in part as a method to monitor the costs of running, running a power company so that the government could call private companies out on their bluff when they said that energy was costing an outrageous amount to produce. It also provides millions with affordable electricity and is overwhelmingly supported by members of all political alignments in the Tennessee area. And so, while our opponents have attempted to refute the public option system and have decried the government as evil and inefficient, it is made increasingly clear that the government, especially at the state level, is not particularly inefficient 
and that some sort of public option is not only desirable, but necessary in order to keep costs low and provide an option in health insurance, especially for those who don't have one. Now, there are those, of you, those among you who have lived without health care, and those who, among you who have lived without access to checkups and useful prescription drugs. One in nine, statistically. A public option plan would help to ensure those, especially uh, during times of transition, uh, during times where public insurance would not necessarily be, or private insurance would not necessarily be available given our current system. And that is why we need public option. I'm not a fist pounding kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> what I am is I want to completely reason through every issue that's at hand. Consider the issues that the con side, that the pro side, and the con side have been arguing over. The argument that a, a, the Indiana plan would not necessarily would not resemble the Massachusetts plan. The only difference that they have cited between these two plans <laughs> is whether or not the individuals in the state are required to have health insurance. In my opinion, and I'm sure in the opinions of many of the House, this is, this is not such a staggering difference that it would make the di that it would change, make the difference between the inefficiencies that we have pointed out with the Massachusetts plan, including the fact that six hospitals, six hospitals are suing for a collective $100 million in order to cover losses of only of $160 million. The pro side has failed to address this. They were doctors leaving the state. How can we ensure that if doctors are being paid less, that they will continue to come to Indiana to provide health care, health care to Hoosiers? If they're not making as much money if they cannot afford to practice in the state, why would they come? It's simple economics. Questions were asked about about options other than the other than the other than the public option. Well, we've already cited tort reform, malpractice reform. These are issues that we can address in the current system rather than implementing an entirely new system which would inevitably present problems of its own, as it has in Massachusetts. Tort reform, malpractice insurance, these are things we can reform now before we jump into something that we don't entirely understand and then that has not been proven to work when it has been impl implemented. This plan will not stand on its own. They say, the pro side will, has said and will continue to say, that, that the cost of this health insurance will not be shifted to people other than those receiving the, the health care. But if that were such an issue, then, why it, then how are they supposed to afford something after a public health care option is instituted that they couldn't afford before? In response to, their, to the numerous accusations that there's not enough com competition, I would like to again cite that there are 213 companies in Indiana that are competing at this time. You cite that 92% of Gary is under one coverage. This happens sometimes, but what you must understand that this is a, that this is possibly a temporary, a temporary situation that will eventually right itself, as capitalism has shown to do. In short. I want you to consider carefully that their argument relies entirely on an idealistic view of a system that can be taken advantage of. This system has proven itself ineffective in Massachusetts, and I would like everyone to consider, consider this carefully. What would make it different in Indiana? What would make the change? How would it be sustained? Thank you. In the matter of the resolution, Indiana should institute a public option health care plan. For the pro side, 35 votes. For the con side, 41 votes. The resolution fails. Thank you.